Your That's 401ks right. sit down and say, we are, well, basically they've taken the replace of a pension. You know, for a lot of people. That's a big part of this. And you've seen a shift go from, you know, working at a company for decades and getting the gold watch and receiving that paycheck, kind of like you went to work, but you didn't have to do that. Now the shift has come to the personal responsibility side, having an account where you put the dollars in and you control your financial future. And that's really dependent upon how much money you're able to sock away in some of these plans. And, you know, for a lot of people, they are sitting there looking at what is it going to take for their family to prepare for retirement? It doesn't just happen by counting on Social Security. For a lot of people, Social Security is a supplement. It's nice. It's a piece of their retirement plan. But it really isn't a sufficient amount to pay for your expenses. Well, I mean, truth told, it was really a, a means to keep people off the street. I mean, when it was first invented, it's really just supposed to be, and, and the key word here is supposed to be a supplement, but we're seeing more and more it's becoming a, a larger part of, uh, you know, the three-legged stool or the four-legged stool as it used to be, where you had a pension from work, Social Security, uh, some retirement savings, and maybe even had an, an investment portfolio that was bringing in some dollars. But now we're really seeing a shift, isn't there? Yeah, and uh, fortunately, one of the uh, largest 401k companies in the world happens to be here today. At least one of the representatives does. That's right. Uh, and, and why that's important is because you're going to have questions. Certainly, you can give us a call at 298-5487. That's 298-5487. Uh, give us a call and let us know. What are you thinking? What are some of your 401k questions? What are some of the issues you might have uh, with those? We're dealing with Dan Moore from Principal financial. Dan, how are you? I'm great. Thanks for having me today. You're welcome. Hey, it's exciting to have you as part of our show. And one of the things we wanted to talk about is the 401k options that people have. First of all, tell us what is the 401k and where does that come from? Yeah, the 401k is actually the section of the tax code that describes the rules and regulations that uh, that surround you know what you're allowed to do, what you're not allowed to do, and mostly describe the tax incentives of a 401k. And the major tax incentives of a 401k are that you are allowed to put your money away pre-income tax and that money grows tax deferred. Those are two major components that allow someone to really sock away more money and not give that money to the government as they're an accumulation phase of what the 401k is. Now, Dan, when people set aside money into a 401k, they're still paying the payroll tax. Is that right? Yeah. The, um, the employer and the employee still pay the payroll taxes. And then when they go to take their distribution at retirement, they pay their income tax. And that's based on what the value is at the time. That's what right. The percentages are. Yeah. And the goal is, ultimately, the goal is to save a lot of money. Um, people sometimes get too caught up in, well, will my tax rate be higher at retirement or lower? The ultimate goal is to save money on taxes today so that money can grow and, and, and really get that magical uh, compounding interest. Yeah, because you actually earn interest on the money that you would have paid in taxes. That's so right. So those dollars are physically there. That's right. Earning money that would have normally just gone to the government. That's exactly right. And then the other benefits of a 401k that are sometimes overlooked are that for the individual, uh, once the money goes into that account, it's bankruptcy and lawsuit protected as well. Very nice. So if anything happens to you as an individual, nobody can touch your 401k money. Well, let me rephrase that. The government can if you don't pay your taxes, and in the event of a divorce, the spouse could be owed up to 50%. But otherwise, in a lawsuit or bankruptcy situation, the 401k is completely protected. Yeah, so what it does do is it, is it protects it from creditors, protects That's it right. from issues. IRAs, on the other hand, individual retirement accounts, on the other hand, are not protected on the same level. However, there's been a recent uh, uh, letter, it's called a, um, uh, a letter ruling. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I think... Uh, forgive me for the term, that ruling has come out and said that is provided if you rolled over that 401k into an IRA and you haven't contaminated it with new contributions, right. apparently it can retain that. Is that right? That's correct. Yeah. So that, uh, that allows us to uh, roll over those funds when you leave the firm. You can even take old 401k money and roll it into your new retirement account. Is that right? Yeah. And the benefit of doing that can be that you have one consolidated account. Uh, some people feel like, well, I'm diversifying when I have multiple accounts. And that's generally not the definition of diversification is to have multiple accounts. Um, there's a better way to diversify. And it's probably easier to track what you really have and really help yourself determine what your actual retirement readiness is by having it in one account and really tracking it there. You know, one of the things that we see, Jeff, uh, with our clients as they come through the office, they often have those multiple 401k accounts, and some of them might have three, maybe seven choices that are that are reasonable. 
and they say, well, you know, we're trying to save and, and plan, and you know, our job is to help them on the safer money side uh, if they want the IRA protection, if they want four hundred one k's. Of course, Principal Financial is there for us to make that happen. Uh, but how many options would be reasonable to expect in your retirement account? Six or ten? I don't know. The that's a great question. It's not a real easy answer. Uh, it, just, it depends on the sophistication level of the investor, I would say. But for most people, what happens is the more choice you're given, the, the more difficult it becomes to make a choice. I yeah. can see that. It's like when you're hungry and you walk into a restaurant, you've got 18 <laughs> choices versus give me a number one, a number two, or a number three. Yeah. Uh, but I, maybe I can help clarify the question. In a good 401k plan, should there be more choices or should there be less? Should there be eight? Should there be 10? Should someone have 20 choices? Because I know there's a, there's, there's a rule that yeah. says they should have a certain number and certain, certain types the, the, of choices. The rule is pretty limiting. Um, it, the rule is it should have at least three asset classes. And I don't think anybody believes that's enough. Mm-hmm. But I, the, the rule actually sets the bar pretty low. But the, generally speaking, it's 10, 10 to 30 investment options. And that's a pretty broad range. But much beyond that becomes paralysis by analysis. You're looking at too many things. It's hard to make a right decision. Uh, today, what we see is mostly between 10 and 30 uh, different investment classes spread across different um, asset classes. And part of that, uh, the, the safety, if you will, or the, the simplicity, maybe that's a better word, that we're seeing is clients are choosing what we call uh, time dated or target date target dated mm-hmm. funds tell me about those what is that all about yeah target date funds have, were built about 10 to 15 years ago as a convenience to participants who really didn't have a great comfort level with investing so they would put their money in this one fund which in which in general you say well you're putting all your eggs in one basket it's a little nervous but these funds are built to be diversified on behalf of the participant with multiple asset classes already built in and they re something called rebalance every quarter generally so that the money never shifts too far in one direction in any one asset class it's basically um really smart investment managers doing the work on your behalf within these funds and they're geared towards a certain time frame of your retirement you can select an investment that's built for 2050 if that's generally the range of the year you think you're going to retire and that way as that investment um, goes as the years go on that investment becomes more conservative so it's really a set it and forget it and let someone else really kind of help you with that, with the bill. With because that, that date is, is what you're saying is that's a date I'm going to retire. That's a, the, the range you're hoping for. Yeah. Okay. Even though you can't predict the exact year you might retire, but usually it's the year you'll turn 65. Okay. And they plus or minus a few years, sure. you know, depending yep. on your risk profile. So, so when, go. I just wanted to say, so what it sounds like is you put money into that target date fund based on when you're going to retire, when you think you'd retire. And then the company... Talk about that a little bit. The company is the one that manages that and moves those assets around yeah. to, to kind of form towards, uh, gearing towards your retirement. Yeah, the, the target date funds have a level of complexity, but to make it pretty easy, it's that they generally move down what we call a glide path that makes the investments gear towards being more conservative as that investor becomes older. So basically, we're shifting, we're going from stocks and risky investments over to a bond portfolio and yeah, over time. That's exactly right. Now, what are you seeing, Dan, when when somebody walks in and they said, you know, I'd like a little help. Uh, you know, they're calling and talking to the advisors before they probably call you guys, of course, but uh, let's reach out and speak to those out there uh, with a couple of definitions. We say asset classes. What does that yeah, mean? Thanks. And it, sometimes we use words that yeah. <laughs> are simple to us and not as easy to understand it. An asset class is something like a uh, the investment itself. The mutual fund invests in a certain size company or a certain sector of the in, of an industry. So the easiest example might be a large cap mutual fund is investing in, generally speaking, Fortune 500 companies, and that's their uh, target range of what which are the largest companies in the U.S. system. If yeah, you will. and an international fund might be an asset class that invests only in international companies. And generally speaking, to get proper diversification, you'd like to have a mix of large companies, mid-sized companies, small companies, maybe some international funds, maybe some emerging, um, and a mix of bonds as well. So the asset class defines what the investment uh, goal is for that actual mutual fund. And so it's okay, if you will, to have uh, a 50-year-old person who says, I want to be riskier. Yeah. I I get it that some people say that I want to be in the safer side, but but I'm okay. I'm going to inherit. I'm an only child. I'm going to inherit $10 million in real estate. Sure. 
they want to put all, all their eggs in one basket, they can go to their 401k and make some of that shift and kind of take a bit more of a risk or a bit more of a chance there, can they? The 401k was really built to be participant directed so that they could um, really choose where they wanted to be and for their own reasons. Um, we talked about the pension plan being the primary retirement savings for uh, a generation prior to us that doesn't exist now. Those yes. plans really rarely exist. And that was the company investing on your behalf. But then the trend has been, um, Jeff, to your point, the personal responsibility. I'm going to save my own money and, and and invest it myself. And that has some trade-offs. I mean, that's a good control, but it can be a little bit nerve-wracking too. But my mom's a great example. She worked for a school system and was investing in her 403B for a long time. And she decided to maintain a level of riskiness that surpassed her age because she had a pension plan with the school district. Right. So you have your own personal goals and uh, motivations, and the 401k allows you to invest as you see fit. And the opposite is also true, right? If you have somebody who says, listen, I'm 35 years old. I've got to take care of my parents someday. Maybe today they're okay, but someday, most likely, I'm going to have to provide some sort of financial assistance to my my siblings, mom and dad, special needs bro brother or sister. I want to not take too much risk. I'm not comfortable with it. I'm right. going to probably work forever. I just can't lose anything. You, you might be surprised to hear that millennials are the most conservative group of investors we've seen since the Depression era. And it's mm -hmm. because they got rocked with the – they came of age when the – the last Great Recession. Yeah, did. the 2008 deal. Yeah, yeah and they That's got right. really nervous about that, and it's really, I'd say, scarred them. So millennials, even though in in the investment philosophy is you should be more aggressive because you're younger, they are way surpassing any other investor to go towards conservative. And millennials, what are the dates on those? Uh, of generally, I think you're hitting millennial if you're about 27, 28, um, and possibly 30 or younger. And then uh, there'll be a range of a new generation coming up then to be defined. But that millennial is grew up on the internet, grew up with uh, instant information, and they unfortunately grew up in 2000 to 2000, 2008 to 2010 ish when the, unfortunately the market really dropped. Well, yeah, their first taste of the word investment or invest, investing comes with, you know, a spanking. You know, it people was. go into the market or whatever market they're talking about, and they see people losing half of their wealth in some yeah. cases, especially in 2008. Especially their parents. And their parents, they, and that's where I was going with it. They're directly affected because their parents, they've seen their demeanor, their whole financial outlook drop. And they say, well, gosh, I don't ever want to be like that. I don't ever want to be like that. Yeah. And yet the ironic part is if they would have invested at a certain point right after that happened, they would have seen the biggest boom that we've seen in a long time. But that's right. their anchor was on the downside and their uh, – uh, investment philosophy was really anchored on the downside. Now, Dan, within a 401k, we're talking about different choices. And, and right now we're talking about asset classes. And certainly there are some fees and some risks that go along with that. Is there a more conservative side that's maybe not a fund? Or is there a guaranteed type fund that, that can be a part of that 401k? Well, there is, generally speaking. Uh, keep in mind that the business owner is sponsoring the 401k plan. So yes. they ultimately, the business owner ultimately dictates what funds will be available on the plan. It's not a universal fund availability to all plans. If a business owner feels like their particular demographic of employees can handle certain risks, they might add certain funds on there. Um, and they may, they may not be aware that there's a guaranteed fund. But in general, most 401k plans have some sort of very safe investment that's either a guaranteed return um, or some type of money market uh, to, for someone who's highly conservative and really doesn't want to take any risk. Because I'm hearing that some people want to participate in that pre-tax contribution so that they can take some of the money that they don't want to spend and they're going to put it in that 401k for their future, but they don't want to lose it. They want to make sure yeah. it's going to be there. So uh, when I've heard in the past, oh, I don't like 401ks, they, they lose money. Or, oh gosh, my, my uncle lost a lot of money in their IRA. I'll never have one of those. They think that 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 name, that nomenclature, the 401k, is the is the good or the bad part of it, when right. in essence, it's really just the way the government looks at the money, yep. and the underlying assets are really what drives the money up or That's down. That's exactly so right. So to put the money in, to participate in the program as an employee, or even as the owner of the company, you do have choices, and one of those could be that safe, guaranteed option. It, it could be. And if it's not available on your particular plan, you should talk to your the business owner or your HR department and ask for one to be added. That'd be very 
possible to happen. Yeah, it's simple to do. We're going to take a break here in just a second. I want to come back and talk about principal financials advantages. What do they have that other companies don't have? And, and that's important because sometimes companies will change 401ks and there's something called a blackout period or a dark period. It's for different ways. What is that? Uh, and then finally, what are some of the things that we can do individually every single day to kind of get towards that maximum 401k contribution? We have some ideas for you. We're going to cover that and a whole bunch more when we come right back on Total Financial Solutions Safer Money Hour. I'm Eric Hallaby with Jeff Gerard, special guest Dan Moore from Principal Financial Group. On your place for news, talk, and information, this is AM 1220, KHTS. 